Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, it's Jesus talking. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for this day. God, I thank you for each and every person that's here. It does my heart good, Lord, when I see folks show up, and I do appreciate it. Uh, Lord, uh, not so much for me, but their faithfulness to you. And, and uh, God, I pray that today would be a, a good day here at church, Lord, that we'd all get something that we could take home and apply to our lives and, and, and serve you better, Lord, and help, help us to be the servants that you want us to be. God, let every ear be attentive. Let us not be having our minds on things that are coming up or things that have happened, God, and, and let us be focused on your word today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, uh, we're going to be talking about the meek service. Jesus said he was meek. Amen. Amen. And Christian means Christ-like. Amen. So, if Jesus is meek, then if we were going to try and be Christ-like, we need to be meek. Amen. So, let's, we use the word meek. What does the word meek mean? Well, I got it in your bulletin, but I'm going to read you a definition of it. It's an adjective, it's, it's, a, it's a descriptive word, and one definition is mild of temper, soft, gentle, not easily provoked or irritated, yielding, given to forbearance under injuries. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. Now we've been talking about all different kinds of servants. Last week we talked about the contented servant. I think that's one of the hardest things in our lives, just to be content with the things that we have. That's hard. But I think kin to that is this deal about meekness. Being, you know, mild of temper. Some of us have tempers. Well, I used to have a terrible temper. God's helped me. And, and, but you could probably go to her right there and she'd wrap me out and say, no, sometimes he still has a pretty good temper. But I used to have a, a terrible temper. It didn't take much at all, and I was off and ready to fight, actually. And, um, but the Lord's delivered me a lot from that. I've still got work to do, as probably most everybody in here has work to do. But soft and gentle, you know. If we look at what America's, us men, if we look at what America's definition of manhood is, and then we look at meek, it's almost the opposite of what the world tells us we should be as a man. And I know one of the things that, that brought me to Christ was a book, and I don't remember the title of the book. It wasn't the Bible, but it was the first thing that got me looking at some things from a spiritual level. And after I read the book, then, of course, I wanted to see what the Bible, and, and it was a Christian author, author, author who quoted the Bible a lot. But I do remember this. I don't remember the name of the book. I don't remember the author, but I do remember this. It was in two sections. It was called Man of Steel, Man of Velvet. And when I was reading that book, the first section, which is, was about half the book, was The Man of Steel. And as I'm reading that, I'm thinking, man, I got this manhood stuff down. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good at all this stuff. This, this, guy's, this guy's preaching to the choir. I, I mean, I'm good at all this. But then the next section was called Man of Velvet. And I remember the first line in that section on Man of Velvet that said that a man of steel alone is not fit to live with. And then it started going on about what a man of velvet was. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm wanting. <laughs> I have none of these attributes. I, not a one of them. And then I knew that I was falling short. And because this book was written in a Christian format, I knew that I fell short before God Almighty. And I said, what am I going to do about this? I, pff, I'm falling short. I, I'm, falling short means I'm going to hell. What am I going to do? So being meek, I'm not trying to give my testimony necessarily, but being meek is kind of the opposite of what we think of as in manhood. But Jesus was meek. You think that there was a man, more of a man than Jesus Christ that ever walked the face of the earth? And he was meek. He was meek. In Numbers 12, verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That should soak in because God used Moses in a very mighty way. 
I mean, Moses is one of the big heroes of, heroes of the Bible. God used Moses to bring his people in typology out of the earth because Egypt's a picture of the earth. And the picture was Christ bringing his people out of this earth to take them to a promised place, heaven. And that whole thing is a picture and a type. And, and Moses was the most meek man on the face of the earth, which tells me if he was a type of Christ, man, Jesus must have been very meek. A very meek man. And he preached things that, that lend to meekness that we try to ignore. We, we don't just try to ignore them. Man, we ignore them. If somebody hits you on the right cheek, turn and let them hit the other side. Don't hit them back. Turn and let them hit the other side. This is the kind of preaching that gets people to say stuff like, well, preacher, if somebody's going to do your family harm, are you just going to stand there and watch? Man, I almost have to say the biblical answer is yes. <laughs> but I'm a man. And I'm not sure that I could just stand and watch. I remember telling a preacher after I'd shortly been saved, and I'm reading Fox's Book of Martyrs. Have any of you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? It's a book about our ancestry, our, our spiritual ancestry, and how they were killed and, and mistreated and abused and how some of these guys watched their babies be bashed against a wall and killed and their wives killed right in front of them. And I went to my preacher and I said, Pastor, I, I don't think I can do this. I, maybe, I, maybe I'm not going to be a good Christian because I'm not sure that I could do that. And he said something that was kind of life-changing for me at the time. He said, well, brother, you're not called upon to do that. You're not going to have the grace to do that because you're not called upon to do that, at least not right now. If God does call you to go through that, he's going to give you the grace and the ability to go through it. In that book, there's this example of a man that was being tortured and 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 thronged and beaten and eventually they they lit the fire that that sent him to heaven you know they put him on a post and they burned him to the stake and his wife's watching they made his wife watch everything that was happened to him and everything they did to him they said you can avoid this just recant your faith just recant your faith and you can avoid all of this and when they lit the fire to burn her husband she cried out to him, I'll be there with you shortly. That's high ground. Amen. Amen. That's high ground. Tells about another guy who, uh, he's one of the church fathers. I don't remember which one it was off the top of my head. But there was a bunch of them that were going to be burned to the stake. And everybody was pretty nervous and scared about it. I mean, if you're watching folks get burned to the stake and you know that you're in line, you're probably not going to be saying, hey, let's take a cat nap. Let's just... Take a snooze real quick. You're probably on pins and needles. You're probably half scared to death. And this guy sensing all the fear that was in that room, and I think the devil feeds on fear. And he's sensing all the fear in that room. He says, listen, I'm going to go up next and get burned next. And I trust that the Lord's not going to let us feel the pain. And so when they light the flame, if I'm not hurting, I will wave my arm. That guy waved his arm until he was dead. The flames killed him, but his signal to everybody else was, it doesn't hurt. God's going to put his hand of protection around you while you go through this. So meekness. Me meekness. Another definition of, of meekness is appropriately humble. In an evangelical sense, submissive to the divine will. Not proud, self-sufficient, or refractory. Not peevish or apt to complain of divine dispensations. Christ says, lean on me, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. So we have Christ as an example, and you know, some of these verses as I'm preparing this message, because seriously, when I, I don't know what, I know the next message is going to be on a servant again, but I don't know what attribute. God doesn't give that to me in advance like that. 
and usually uh, he gives it to me as I need it and then I'm going through the lesson before you go through the lesson and God's teaching me like I'm trying to teach you and and it's a uh, it's kind of a, a funny thing but as I'm going through this message my lunch is getting eaten in front of me constantly constantly and uh, when you when you when you start compiling the different messages that we've looked at about the controlling our anger, the angry servant, the humble servant. Those are some of the different things we've looked at. The content servant, the happy servant. When you start compiling these things together, you see a pattern of what God expects our lives to be like. And as you see that pattern, you start saying, man, I got some work to do. I got some work to do. And in this life, we're always going to have some work to do. So there might be somebody that's here on the plane of this thing, a servant, that they're saying, I have some work to do. But guess what? There's people that may be here on that plane of being a servant that they're hearing these same messages and saying, man, I have some work to do. Because in this life, we're never going to attain completely. Now, the Bible says, faithful is he that called you that will also perform it. He's going to see you through to perfection. But we're not going to have that perfection until we see him and then we will be like him. And um, I look forward to that day. Man, I'm sick and tired of disappointing my Savior. Sick and tired of it. And I, I, I want to try and apply these principles to my life so that I can do better. And uh, somebody can say, well, preacher, you're just preaching messages that say we should just be a bunch of wusses and take everything. You know, that goes completely against my grain. My whole life has not been that way. My whole life has been rough and tumble. <laughs> my whole life is we have a disagreement we can we can step right out there and settle that disagreement that's been my whole life and and for the lord to work on me and say and there's some other folks that were just like that peter was a rough and tumble guy oh they're here to get you lord whop lops off the ear of the high priest servant and what did jesus say knock that off put that sword away heals the ear <laughs> peter got all kind of mad over it and so I look at that example and I say, some of you could be getting all kind of mad over this preaching, but it's not coming from me, folks. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is contrary to my personality, these principles. Just like it's contrary to your personality. Yes, brother? Moses was the same way. He, he killed an Egyptian. Got, got, got ahead of the Lord. Yep. He, was, yeah, he was trying to deliver... He wasn't a milk sop. He, was able to, he had the ability to kill a man. Yeah, you know? amen. Amen. There's a lesson to be learned there. And what did he do when Miriam and, and uh, I can't think of the Aaron. brothers, Aaron, when they, when they challenged him and said, you're not the only one here. We, we have much authority as you have. And, and uh, he was humble about it. He didn't defend himself. He went to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord took care of it. Amen. Amen. So Psalm chapter 22 verse 26 says, the meek shall eat and be satisfied, they shall praise the Lord that seek him, your heart shall live forever. That's saying for the meek. And I read that verse, and you know what went through my mind, and you may say, this is that stupid preacher. What went through my mind when I read that, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. I think about all the meals that I complained about that my wife labored over, and I wasn't hungry for it. And I'm like, oh, are we having that? I didn't want that. That's not me. It's not being satisfied. Amen? We should eat and be satisfied. We should be happy with whatever the Lord sets in front of us. But that's not the main intent of that verse. You should be seeing a connection as we go through these between these attributes of God's servants. They're satisfied, as the verse said. Last week we talked about the contented service. And another word for content, being contented is to be satisfied. And so the, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. Uh, and, and like I said, this is one of the most difficult things to get a hold of and to apply to your life. I also see a connection between meekness and praising and seeking the Lord. Everyone, everybody sitting in this room, I believe everybody in this room is saved. Now I could be wrong. I could be wrong about that. Because there's some good fakers out there. But I believe. But you can't say, well, whew, the preacher believes, so I'm good. 
Because you can fake me out, but you can't fake God out. But I believe everybody in this room is saved. In order for you to even have been saved, there had to be an element of meekness in your life. There had to be. There had to come a point where you said, I can't do this. And you turn to Jesus Christ. That's a demonstration of meekness. Amen? There's a connection between meekness and praising the Lord, and there's a connection between meekness and seeking the Lord. Preacher, I just, you know, I, I enjoy church service, but I get away from church service, and by the time it's time for the next church service, I'm not so excited about coming to church service anymore. You know what your problem is? You need to meek out a little bit. Because you're not being meek. You're not seeking the Lord. You're seeking your own gratification. But preacher, there's a good television program on on Wednesday nights. Really? How's that going to fit in Jesus' judgment with you that that television program was more important? You know, as we're in the Laodicean church age, you know what the Philadelphia church age, which was the one right before us, the Philadelphia church age was the only church age that God had nothing bad to say about them. And the Philadelphia church age is the only church age that God has nothing good to say about them. And we, the Philadelphia church age is the only church age, I might have said it wrong, the Philadelphia church age is the only church age that God had nothing bad to say about. The Laodicean church age is the only church age that God had nothing good to say about. And we're in the Laodicean church age. You know what the Philadelphia preachers didn't have to put up with that the Laodicean preachers do have to put up with? A television set. A movie theater. Yep. Folks that think that their purpose in life when they're not at work is to be entertained. People in the Philadelphia church age came expecting to get something from the Lord. A lot of people, and I'm not saying every person, a lot of people in the Laodicean church age come and say, entertain me. Well, I can't compete with Bruce Willis and Die Hard. I, I don't know any modern movies, folks. Sorry. <laughs> I don't go to the movie theater, so I got to go back in time to stuff that was popular back in the day. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Ter Terminator, I can't compete with that. I'm, there's not going to be all kinds of pyro effects up here and explosions and things to keep you on the edge of your seat. You know what's got to keep you on the edge of your seat? Your desire to learn about God and follow Him. And you know what it takes for you to seek the Lord and to try and follow Him? You know what it takes? It takes meekness. Because it's the meek that seek after the Lord. Hmm, there's a shortage of meekness in the world today. Everybody wants everything. Watching a commercial the other day, and it's probably a song on the radio. I don't listen to secular music, but there was probably a song on the radio. But the commercial has this tune in the background, and it says, I want it all, I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now. That's America today. I want it all, and I want it now. Nothing meek about that. Nothing satisfied about that. Nothing content about that. Psalm 25 verse 9 says, The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Preacher, I just don't seem to be learning anything about the Lord. Check your meek meter. Because <laughs> he's going to teach the meek. What makes a meek person teachable and the non-meek unteachable? That's part of it. That is part of it. Desire. Pride is a big part of it. Absolutely. Pride. You're not going to teach me nothing. I already know it all. Well, that's not meek. That's the opposite of meek. That's braggadocious. Pride gets in the way of learning. Now, God can take a meek heart and He can guide it. He can direct it. He can teach it. So what's a meek heart to the Lord? I'm open, God. Show me. Show me. And not just show me out of your word, but here's another prayer. Lord, help our pastor <laughs> to show us and to lead us. Now, I believe folks pray for me. I'm not trying to imply that you don't, but that's God's plan. You know what? God can do something with a meek heart where he can't do something with a proud heart. And with a heart that has no desire. I'm... You know, there's a point of being satisfied, but there's a point where satisfaction is not appropriate. 
I'm satisfied with how far I've come in the Lord, and I'm not going an inch further. Is that good satisfaction? No. no. We should never be satisfied with where we're at in the Lord. We should always be striving to do better. A preacher friend of mine used to always preach, and he'd say, as I know better, I do better. I wish that was a true statement. Because sometimes you're taught things and you know better, but you still don't do no better. To do better takes effort. And it takes a meek heart. But you know, if the Lord shows you something, He's going to give you the ability to follow through and do it. Amen, preacher. If you feel like you don't have guidance from the Lord, there's a couple of things that could be going wrong there. And one, I've preached over and over again, and I'm never going to quit preaching it because I think it's part of a calling of a pastor. One is found in 2 Corinthians 13.5. It says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, that how that, Christ, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Now, <clears throat> I believe to the Christian, or to at least a professing Christian, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Because there's folks that lie to themselves. And you know why you lie to yourselves about whether you're saved or not? Because there's some folks that have gone through a motion of salvation. They know in their heart they didn't get saved. They know in their heart they weren't really seeking salvation when they did it. But they lie to themselves and say, oh yeah, that counted, that, I'm saved. Why would they do that? Pride. I'm not going to go down that aisle and get saved. I'm not going to go talk to the pastor about being saved. I'm not going to do any of that because everybody would know that I've lived a sham. A sham. Everybody would know that I, I've been faking for years. God can't do anything with that. Because he's not going to bust your arm to get it right. So what does he do about it? He says, listen, examine yourself. Now I know from the top of my head to the bottom of my foot I'm saved. But I still examine myself. <laughs> prove your own selves. How do you prove your own selves? What's your actions like? Are you walking with the Lord? When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sends on our way or something like that? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you fighting the Lord? Examine yourself. Prove your own self by walking with him. Know ye not your own selves that how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? Now, um, before I go into that, because I'm going to define, tell you what that last, because that last part of the verse, some folks get a little confused and go, what is that even talking about? Know ye not your own selves that, Christ, that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? Before we do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about the numerology of that verse. <laughs> Because it's significant. It's chapter 13, verse 5. Remember when we taught numerology? What's number 13? Anybody remember what number 13 is? It's a number of a curse. The whole world knows that. 13's unlucky. 13's a curse. Friday the 13th. <laughs> oh my gosh. Don't let a black cat walk in front of you. Don't go under a ladder. 13 is... Unlucky, it's a curse. It's a number of the curse. So in chapter 13 and verse 5, what's verse 5? Anybody remember what numerology number 5 is? Yeah. Death. death. Curse and death. You're supposed to examine yourself so you don't fall under the curse and you don't die the second death. That's not by coincidence. That's by design. Forty is a number of testing. What? Testing. 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 So, uh, there are a number of points in the verse. Like I said, you're supposed to look deeply into your heart to determine if you're truly saved. That's one point. Look deep in your heart. When I got saved, as, as our dear brother Maurice would say, what was my motivation for doing it? Yeah. Well, everybody said I needed to. That's not salvation, folks. 
I was at church camp and all my friends were saying, go up and, and, and say the prayer. That's not salvation. You know what? That prayer doesn't save you. Amen. That prayer doesn't save you. But the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Something has to happen in that heart first. And if something didn't happen in that heart but you did something with your mouth, that meant nothing. Because with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I know that I need something. And that's a calling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to lead every single human being into some form of truth. And he's going to give them as much as they desire. Well, when you accept Christ, your heart changes. And your heart does change. Amen. Amen. You have the new man. But you still have the old man, unfortunately, while you walk on this earth. And so we have our ups and downs, our failures and our successes. That baggage that we drag around. Amen, sister. Amen. So the first point is that you're supposed to deeply examine your heart. And listen, if you say, how can I trust my heart? That's a good question. It's real simple. Pray and the Holy Spirit will guide you. If you say, man, I examined, but I really can't remember what my motive was. Pray to God and say, God, would you reveal to me if I'm lost? And you know what that Holy Spirit will do? Holy Spirit will tell you, yeah, you're, you're, you're lost. That. You, your attitude wasn't towards salvation when you got saved. But you know what we do because we're not meek? We don't listen to that Holy Spirit. We ignore that Holy Spirit. I don't care how many times you prayed a believer's prayer. If your heart wasn't set for salvation, you didn't get saved. Because there's no magic in those words. I don't care if it was Billy Graham that told you the words to say. There's no magic in the words. The magic is in the heart. There should, be fruit. there should be fruit. So examine your heart to prove that you're in the faith. And then you're supposed to prove your faith by growing and developing in these Christian attributes that we're talking about. If you're not seeing growth, you need to ask yourself. I mean, step one, am I saved? Step two, is there growth in my life? And if the answer to step one is, yes, I'm saved... The answer to step two is, no, there's no growth in my life. We need to go back and re-examine step one. Because the Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. And if you're not showing fruits of growth and development, you probably didn't get saved. Back to step one. <laughs> Preacher, I just can't seem to get a handle on this besetting sin. We all have a besetting sin. And let me give you a little secret. You'll never get a handle on it. But God will get a handle on it for you. Let go and let God, as they say. Prove your faith by developing in these, in these traits. And um, not all the attributes of a Christian are positive. I taught on things to avoid, too. Amen? Amen. Talked about the angry servant. And uh, so, the final thing, at the end of the verse it says, um, it points out that if Jesus is not in you, you're a reprobate. Prove your own self. No, you're not your own self. That, uh, what's the exact wording? I don't want to blow it here. How that Jesus Christ is in you. If he's not in you, except you be reprobates. If he's not in you, you're a reprobate. So what's a reprobate? That's another one of your definitions on the bulletin. It says, not enduring proof of trial, not of standard purity or fitness, disallowed, rejected, abandoned in sin, lost to virtue or grace, abandoned to error or in apostasy. That's the person that's not getting any victory in their life, the person that's not seeing any spiritual growth. The Bible's saying you're reprobate, and you're right back to step one. Examine yourself to see if you're saved. Can't stress that enough. Say, preacher, why can't you stress that enough? Because, folks, I want you to get this. The Lord Jesus Christ said in the end, there's going to be folks that saying, Lord, <laughs> remember me? I did this, I did that, I did many things in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Scary thought. It's a scary thought. So you examine yourself. There's a lot of things in that examination. I just 
hate going to church. I do it because I'm supposed to, but I hate it. Well, that's not a good sign. I can't stand reading the Bible. That's not a good sign. <laughs> I'd rather get together with my drinking buddies than get together with folks from church. That's not a good sign. <laughs> There's a lot of things to examine. I always watch the inappropriate programs on TV. That's not a good sign. I love inappropriate music that talks about demons and devils and suicide and da 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 da. Heavy metal junk. That's not a good sign. Preacher, are you saying I can't listen to heavy metal music? I'm not saying anything. I told you I don't make rules. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. <laughs> And if it's wrong and you can't quit it, beat yourself up because you're fighting God, not me. The Holy Spirit will tell you whether it's right or not. I can tell you this. Any song, whether it's heavy metal or not, that glorifies going to hell is not of God. That's a no-brainer. I don't even have to think about that. Any uh, music that glorifies Crawley? Uh, huh? Alistair Crawley, he's a Satanist, and there's songs out there. Ozzy Osbourne has a song that's totally dedicated to him. And he's a Satanist. That's not godly. And as a Christian, yesterday we watched uh, some movie that I liked, and at the end of it, an ACDC song came on. I clicked it off because I said, you know, my flesh likes that. <laughs> my flesh likes that. And I know it's not good for me. And I'm not going to feed my flesh. So I'm not going to listen to that end song to that show. Because I want to tap my foot. I want to do all that good stuff. The other thing you should consider beyond just whether you're saved or whether you're walking with God. If you're saying I'm not. I'm not following the Lord the way that I think you're implying I should preach. And I just don't know what's wrong. But I know I'm saved. I've, I've examined myself over and over. I know I'm saved. Check your meek meter. Because <laughs> if you're not meek, God, listen, God is a, I've said this before, he's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you in any way. He's going to say, here's some information. What are you going to do with it? And then he's going to step back and watch you. I don't like that. I'm not doing anything. Well, fine, go do your own thing. I'm through showing you stuff. There's implications in the Bible that God's going to try and guide you in things, and if you block the door, he quits trying to guide you in things. And it has to do with right. uh, meekness. meekness. <laughs> but pride goes right with that, because pride is what keeps you from being meek. The Bible clearly says that God will guide the meek. The more you learn, the more you want to learn. Amen. It should be that way. It's not that way with everybody, which goes back to examine yourself, amen? So, <clears throat> the Bible clearly teaches that God, God's going to guide the meek, that he's going to teach the meek. And if you're full of yourself and driven to achieve the things that you want, <laughs> there's little room for God to guide you. The other day I told a joke and I didn't get it out because the brother here figured it out. I said, you know how to make God laugh. Tell him your plans for your life. <laughs> That'll make him laugh. What you want doesn't fit into the picture. I, I think that, and I love Jim Mottledge. He's the pastor over in Wolsenburg, and he's the one that suggested that I pray about coming to Alamosa. And we did pray about coming to Alamosa, and I contacted him after we prayed about it, and it probably took about three weeks before we got a clear answer. And I called him, I said, the Lord's called me to Alamosa. He said, well, brother, I recommend that you make a road trip. Go check out the community. Make sure you like it there before you go making commitments. And my response to him was, if God called me there, what difference does it make whether I like the community or not? I, my desires don't fit into it. Now, praise the Lord, when we got here, at first one, because we weren't real familiar with Colorado, Jim Mollich, who is a fabulous preacher that has built huge churches 
church he built in Idaho is running 800 to 1,000 people a week. He built a church in Rochester, New York that was probably running about 2,000 a week. He built a church in the Seattle, Washington area that's probably running 1,500 to 2,000 a week. And now he's in Walsenburg. And when we drove through Walsenburg, I turned to Lisa and said, why would Jim come here? <laughs> but you see, it doesn't matter what you want or where you want to be. It doesn't matter. Your plans don't fit into it. God's plans fit into it. Amen? Amen? Pride builds a wall that God isn't going to penetrate. Now, he'll put circumstance in your life that will try and bust down your pride, but he's not going to say, okay, I got this lesson that I have for you, but your pride's in the way, so I'll just kind of weave this thing through that pride and let you get the lesson. He won't do that. He can penetrate the wall, but he ain't gonna. But he ain't gonna. He can, but he won't. He doesn't want a bunch of robots that just walk around doing things because he forced that on them to be that way. He wants us to make choices that demonstrate our love toward him, that demonstrate our love toward each other, that demonstrate love, that demonstrate compassion to demonstrate charity because that's who he is but he's not going to force it on us he's not going to you have to be open and what's the door the key that unlocks that door to openness meekness, meekness. amen Psalm 37 verses 7 through 11 says rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. What? Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Now you want to know what? The world's off kilter right now. The, the meek is not running things right now. It's the evil, forward, um, men with... Uh, high esteem men with pride. pride and high goals and I'm going to be a, a gabillionaire at any cost and who cares who I trample on my way up to the top ambition, ambition. amen that's who's running the world and who's the father of pride mm -hmm. Satan is the father of pride and God says don't, don't get caught up in all that nonsense and we do Listen, I want America to be great again. I don't think it's going to happen because if you, look at, uh, if you look at prophecy in the Bible, the world's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get better and better and better. It's going to get worse. That's what the Bible says. But I want America to be great again. I love America. And I'm going to try and do my due diligence through voting or, or whatever means to try and keep America in a fashion that gives me the religious liberties that I enjoy. But we're not supposed to get caught up in all that stuff. We're just not supposed to. We're not of this world. We're passing through. The person that is prob prosperous in his way normally, there's exceptions to every rule, Normally that person that's prosperous, and I mean prosperous from a world's definition of prosperous, usually that person's not meek. People look at some people like Frank Sinatra. He was successful, amen. They call him the godfather, is that what they call him? Is that what they call him, the godfather? I think they call him, he's the head of the Rat Pack or something like that. Frank Sinatra was. And he does that song, I did it my way. 
No, nobody stepped in to do anything for me. Is that meek? I did it my way. I don't want it done my way. My way is going to blow up in my face. My way is going to be wrong. And, and I don't care how prosperous you are in this world. That guy, uh, is his name Jeff Bozo or Steve Bozo? The guy that owns Amazon. I always say Bozo. I know it's not Bozo. It's what? Jeff. Yeah, I think it's Jeff. People look at him. He's going to be the first trillionaire in our world. People look at him and say, man, he's successful. And it's all going to come to nothing. Yeah. To nothing. And I'm going to be moving into a mansion, and he's going to go to hell if he doesn't accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, Jesus Christ has given him enough light that he can get saved. And I hope he does. <laughs> I don't want him to go to hell. I hope he does get saved. But the Bible in this section of Scripture that I just read is saying all that stuff is going to perish. It's going to fade away. And the meek are going to inherit the earth. So for his three score and ten, that's what the Bible says the average lifespan is. That's 70 years because a score is 20 years. Three score, three times 20 is 60, and 10, 70. For the 70 years in this world, he has, he's on top of the world. And for eternity, he's going to burn in a devil's hell. For 70 years, we may wonder where our next meal or our next payment for our house or what we, we may be struggling for the 70 years that we're on this earth but when this is over with our meek heart toward God we get to move into a mansion, into a mansion. Hallelujah. and we get to have riches that this world's never seen or understood the Bible says I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God's prepared for us we can't even imagine it I like that song, I can only imagine, but you know what? You can't even imagine it. Better word, if you want to be more accurate, was I can't even imagine. <laughs> Not I can only imagine, but I can't even imagine. Amen? I like that song, though, i got to admit it. Any angry person, we're supposed to forsake wrath, and we're supposed to forsake anger. Wrath is, is uh, God's job, not ours. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're supposed to not only stay away from evil, but we're, as we saw in our final study in the book of Thessalonians, we're supposed to stay away from even the appearance of evil. Even the appearance. And the King James Bible is the only Bible that says to stay away from the appearance of evil. Most of them will say, stay away from all types of evil or all kinds of evil. Well, that's a no-brainer. We know we're supposed to stay away from evil. It's a revelation to say you're supposed to even stay away from the appearance of it. Well, preacher, this isn't wrong, but some folks may think it's wrong. Well, then stay away from it. That's the appearance of evil. Stay away from it. You find that in 1 Thessalonians 5.22. It says, abstain from all appearance of of evil. And like I said, every New English version takes out appearance and just says stay away from evil. I think there's a huge difference between staying away from evil and staying away from the appearance of evil. The meek shall inherit the earth. Psalm verse 76, 1 through 9, not verse, Psalm 76, verses 1 through 9, it says, In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. And Salem also is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place is Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword, and the battle, Selah. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted are spoiled, they have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and the horse are cast into a deep sleep. Thou, even thou, art to be feared. And who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth. Selah. 
God's going to fight the battle for us. He's going to save us from all the nonsense that's going on in the world. And this is important today because I think the day's coming when, because I think God's given me some grace now to go through some torment. <laughs> well, why would he be giving me that grace if that might not be on the horizon? I'm in a phase in my Christian walk where I'd say, man, it would actually be pretty good to be persecuted for the Lord. It'd be pretty good to get those rewards. It'd be pretty good to be thrown in jail for my, the cause of Christ. It'd be pretty good to be beaten. It'd be pretty good to be martyred. I had a preacher one time tell me that if you're a Christian, if you're truly a Christian, and you backslide, and you're walking away from God, he's going to bring all the circumstances back in your life that brought you to the point of salvation. Now, for some of us, that might not mean anything. My life was a mess when I got saved. I don't care to have my life go back to where it was before I got saved. I don't know that that's true or not. I, I know that, that there's nothing biblical necessarily about it. But, but So let's press on. Psalm 147, verse 6 says, The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. So the Lord's going to lift up the meek. But he's going to cast down the wicked. I, I don't know if you're getting it by now, but I'm looking at the things the Lord's going to do for the meek, and I'm saying, help me, Lord, to be meek. <laughs> I want to be meek. I want to put aside my own thoughts and my own ways of doing things, and I want to grab that meekness of the Lord and be settled down in that meekness. Wickedness is the opposite of, of meekness. We get that from this verse. The Lord lifteth up the meek and casteth the wicked down to the ground. So that's an opposite. Lift up and cast down. So wickedness is the opposite of meekness. And God's going to cast away those wicked into the pits of a literal hell created for the devil and his angels. You don't have to be Charles Manson or Adolf Hitler to go to hell. <laughs> And it's funny because when you're dealing with lost folks and, and like going door to door, they'll always say, well, I may have sinned, but I'm no Charles Manson. <laughs> to which I always reply, well, if Charles Manson was a measuring stick, that might, <laughs> that might work for you. But God's measuring stick's not down here. The question isn't, are you as bad as Charles Manson or are you as bad as Adolf Hitler? The question is, are you as good as Jesus Christ? Because he's the measuring stick. He's the measuring stick. You going to be okay, birthday girl? Can't, uh, can't choke to death on your birthday. It's against the law. Psalm 149 verse 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. See what I'm saying? That everybody that's saved had to at some point exercise some meekness because that's the path to salvation. That's where you're open up to saying, I can't do this, I need God. And um, he's going to beautify the path. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I'd rather be beautiful in God's eyes than be beautiful in the world's eyes. I've seen some, some Christian, both men and women, that you say, I'm going to get in trouble with the wife over this. You would look at them and say, man, they, got, they didn't get hit with the ugly stick. They got the whole tree dropped on top of them. But, but God looks at them and says, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Because God doesn't look at this. God looks at this. Our, our beauty, if we have any, will fade in time. We get old and we start getting wrinkles and gray hair and muscles start sagging and bellies start dragging and all that good stuff. Keep, a, keep, a heart, keep your eye on the heart. The world tells you when, you're, when your spouse gets to where they're not as beautiful, I'm lucky my spouse is just drop dead gorgeous <laughs> but trade them in on a new model no stay focused on what's on the inside because that's where the beauty is 
You trade spouses, all you do is try to trade for a different set of headaches. <laughs> Amen? Preacher, that's good. <laughs> Isaiah 11 verse 4 says, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. The implication, as I said before, is the world is out of balance. And it is. The meek seem to be losing the battle, but I've read the book to the end and we win. Amen? Amen? We're not going to lose. The balance is going to be made right by the righteous king. Isaiah 29 verse 19 says, The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. I love being happy in the Lord. I do. You know, some of my favorite days are the days that we have like a potluck after church and we sit around and fellowship and, and oftentimes the conversations about spiritual things and, and how the Lord's working in our lives. Man, that's just enjoyable. Enjoyable. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to, the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty unto the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You know what that tells you? God's going to send preachers to meek people. Amen, amen, amen. He heals them. And he sets them free. Now some may say, well, I have this infirmity in my flesh and I didn't get healed. He heals you spiritually, folks. God's always interested in the spiritual side and not the physical side. Now he may heal the physical side, but we get men. We're totally physical. We always focus on the physical. God doesn't even pay attention to the physical. God focuses on the spiritual. And we do good to quit focusing on the physical and focus on the spiritual. We're, we're getting close, folks. Zephaniah 2, verse 3 says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought in his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall find... Excuse me. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So, <clears throat> it's a command. It doesn't say, hey, if you're smart, you should ought to maybe think about being meek. Tells, it's a commandment for us to be meek. Seek meekness. Preacher, I always have to have the last word in an argument. Ain't nothing meek about that. Nothing meek about that. You know what meekness is? Being the first one to say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong. What? What strange, strange doctrine is that he bringeth? We're supposed to be meek. Honey, I'm sorry. I was wrong. You know how to keep a marriage forever? Learn how to say, honey, I'm sorry. I was wrong. But I wasn't wrong, preacher. Really, is it worth it? Amen. Is it worth it? Lisa and I haven't been in very many arguments in the whole time we've been married. We haven't been in very many, but from a, there have been a few occasions where we've gotten in arguments and it would just hit us. What are we even doing? Is this even worth it? What difference does it make? Well, I'm right. You're wrong. Who cares? Who cares? What difference does it make? The more meek we are, according to the Bible, the closer we get to the Lord. That's just a fact. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's... Uh, Jesus Christ in the um, Beatitudes quoting Psalm 37 verse 11 which we've already read. In Matthew 21 verse 5 it says Tell ye the daughter of Zion Behold thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt the full of an ass. Now we talked about different things today that might cause us not to be meek. None of us are going to face what Jesus Christ faced and he was meek about it. He said he could have called down and God would have sent 12 legions of angels to destroy this world and he wouldn't have had to gone through what he went through on the cross. But he was meek. 
and submitted himself to it and said, I'll take it. That's meekness. But he was wrong, preacher. Well, you may not go on to fence for him, but you may go on to fence for him. Preacher, you don't get it. They did me wrong. <laughs> did they do you as wrong as they did the man that created this whole thing? And yet he submitted totally in meekness to the cross. He did it for me. And if you were the only sinner in the world, he would have done it for you alone. God demonstrated his meekness because when Satan rebelled against him, you know what? All God, God didn't have to do any of this. <laughs> God could have just said, you know what? You cease to exist. Boom! It had been gone. <laughs> yeah. But he's meek. Do you think you can take this over? Well, give it your best shot. Give it your best shot. Let's see if you can take it over. That's meekness. And that wasn't saving any world. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 says, But let the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price, Boy, there's a good motivation for being meek. God says being meek, to me, is a great price. God recognizes the sacrifice there is in being meek. Almost always, meekness invokes sacrifice. God can use anything. And so I've seen some preachers that were downright in your face, which is the opposite of meekness, and they win souls to Christ. But God's not happy with their attitude. You know, when I'm preaching, I'm, I'm normally really direct and say things the way they are and point out falsehoods. But if I'm doing one-on-one -on -one with somebody that believes those falsehoods, I'm not in their face. Not at all. I very seldom say, you're wrong. Now, if it's coming to the end of me dealing with them and they're going to reject it, then I might say, you're wrong. According to the Bible, not according to me. But in dealing with them, I'll just bypass what they said that's wrong and take them to truth. I won't argue whether you're going to be a god or not. <laughs> I'll just show you that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. That's what the Bible says. I'll take him to all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Well, how are you going to be a God if you come short of the glory of God? I, I mean, I don't have to point that out, but the verse itself. Listen, that's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to show him the truth. The Holy Spirit will be saying, see, he's right and you're wrong. He's right and you're wrong. And they may violate the Holy Spirit. They may ignore the Holy Spirit. They may go their own way and do what they want to do. But I'll leave them with the wrath of God's abiding on you. Because you rejected his son. God considers meekness a great price. He wants us to be meek. He tells us to be meek. He commands us to be meek. Shouldn't we strive for it? Next time you feel that anger welling up in you, ask the Holy Spirit to just tap you on the shoulder and say, meekness. Mild of temper, soft, gentle, not easily provoked or irritated, yielding. Honey, you're right, I'm wrong. Yielding, given to forbearance under injuries, not fighting back. I don't like that preacher. Your arguments with God, not me. I'm just telling you what the book says. Appropriately humble. In an evangelical sense, submissive to the divine will. I don't like this message. Well, you're not being submissive to a divine will. <laughs> we should be angry about a lot of the things that are going on in the world today. But that anger needs to be controlled. Here's an example of unrighteous indignation. I'm, ang I'm a Christian, 
I'm angry about what's going on in the world, so I'm going to take up arms and get out of the will of God. <laughs> Jesus set the thing very straight in his trial. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, we would take up arms and defeat you. But my kingdom now, because it's going to be in the future, is not of this world. When it's time for his kingdom to be established on earth, that's the time that we will take up arms. And not until then. That's biblical. And if you don't like it, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm sorry because I'm not going to apologize for the truth that God has given us in his book. Now, what I'm talking about is high ground. Like I said, I'm, I'm not going to profess that I can live up to, to all that. If somebody's hurt my wife, unless God just supernaturally imposes a, a meek spirit on me, I'm probably going to react. <laughs> but we're supposed to strive for meekness. What I don't want to see anybody do is say, well, I'm just me and God has to forgive me. No. no. Work toward it. To work. Yeah, work toward it. And, and allow him to work in your heart, amen?